clearly SEO is a very hot topic amongst you, the small business owners. Reviews of last week's episode on SEO included, and I quote, your best yet, Timbo, close quote, and quote, the most practical marketing podcast I've ever listened to. Three exclamation marks, close quote. Well, strap in because Dana Tomazo, one of the world's leading SEO experts, continues to answer your most pressing SEO questions to set you up for a profitable year ahead. It's the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show, thanks to American Express. Yeah, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show. Successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Timbo. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing malarkey. I'm your host, Timbo Reed, but you, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Today's 439th episode is made possible thanks to American Express and to see how you can turn your existing expenses into some seriously good rewards, Google Amex Business after this episode. Another big show today as we continue our chat with Kickpoint's Dana Di Tommaso, one of the world's leading SEO experts who continues to answer all your most pressing SEO questions and then some. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Now, if you haven't listened to last week's episode 438, then I suggest you do that first, as that was part one, uh, where Dana overviews the fundamentals of SEO that every website must get right first. Plus, she also answers around 15 SEO questions that were sent in to me by you. In part two, this episode, the questions and answers keep coming as we cover Here's what we cover. How the little guys can compete against the big brands when it comes to search engine optimization. Which SEO play will give you the biggest impact up front? We talk about voice search, the importance of content, how to get found locally, and so much more. So thanks again for your questions, which have formed the basis of this and last week's episodes. So let's go and see who the next question is from. Laurel Geimer of La Perouse Guest House. Oh, in Lawn, I have stayed at that guest house. It's absolutely beautiful. She asks, how do we, a small accommodation business, compete with Airbnb, Booking.com and Whatif.com? Well, we've kind of touched on that. By Is your answer going to be, Dana, niching down? Well, or you should list yourself on those places. Um, maybe not Airbnb, but Booking.com and Whatif.com. Um, which I know I'm not saying quite right because I'm not Australian, but <laughs> I, I'm familiar with that website. Yeah, part of the and Commonwealth. You get, yeah, you can get you can get yourself listed on these sites, and I know you have to pay them a commission when you are listed on there, but certainly that does provide value in that those sites are ranking really well. So why not just get yourself listed on those sites? Um, but then if you decide that that's not something you want to pursue, then think about things like, again, getting out there in that local community. So if your local travel association has a website, you know, often people will find that when they're searching for, you know, I am traveling to, you know, Melbourne. So I'm going to look up some travel Melbourne and I'm going to look at all the different places that they recommend. Can you contribute an article? Can you make sure you're listed in their directory, for example? You know, what can you do to make yourself stand out? Um, so Edmonton, Tourism here has Explore Edmonton, and they'll often feature businesses uh, on their homepage and talk about what they do, and that really gives them a boost for tourist traffic. So see if you can build those kinds of relationships. Would another idea for Laurel be to now? So Laurel's guest house, La Perouse, is down in a little seaside village outside of Melbourne called Lawn. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a very popular place. People would be googling things about lawn all the time. What to do in lawn? Yep. Where to eat in lawn? Where's the best coffee in lawn? How much yep. is it to do this in lawn? Um, would Laurel be? Would it be a good idea for her to create a blog that has an edit? What I call an editorial mission that is all about lawn. And yeah, I you, think so. Okay. 
I, I think that would be valuable. I mean, that's where you Google it and see it. So like the, if you can't beat them, join them. So if you find that you're Googling this and there's lots of other people who've done this already, then don't try to compete with them. See if you can get listed on there. Uh, but see if you can contribute guest posts, for example, as well. Um, but if no one has done this, yes, go ahead and do that for sure. Okay. Uh, Adam Nealens of Kelper Organics, have we answered this? He says, with the goalposts constantly changing with Google's algorithm, where do we start? Out of all the tasks we can complete for SEO, which is which one is the most important slash impactful for a stronger ranking on Google? Anything to add to I that? I would say, yeah, go back to those foundational items that we talked about at the beginning yep. and make sure you're covering your basics. Um, and I find, honestly, that the thing that I'm doing the most of right now is site speed. So make sure your site is loading quickly, and it really does make a difference. To another foundational one, and I was amazed. I went up to a place called Fraser Island a few days ago, and, you know, I was looking for all different things to do uh, up there. The places that I found, their websites, none of them were mobile-friendly. And oh, they, yeah, do that, please. You know, yeah. <laughs> that matters. Matters big time. I mean, did, did you have any stats around that, Dana, in terms of um, the, the size of screen versus the ser- searches done on what size screen? I imagine most searches are done on a smartphone screen these days. Yeah, absolutely. We have many clients where more than half of their traffic is mobile. And so this is the other problem is that as marketers and probably you, you sit at a computer all day, you think of yourself as a computer. Many of your customers may only experience your website on a smartphone. Mm. So take a look at your stats. If more than half of your customers are using smartphones to engage with you, use your website more than half the time on a smartphone. If it irritates you, it's irritating your visitors. Back to Adam's question. Um, uh, Is he also better to, when going to speak to an SEO company, saying, listen, Mm -hmm. Can you do the foundational work? Listen to this podcast. That'll explain that. And then mm-hmm. what's what's the other thing? Is it the ongoing work that needs to be constantly attended to? Yeah. I mean, it depends, again, on the competition. So do you need to focus on blogging? Is content particularly weak in your industry? Or do you need more authority? You don't have a lot of links leading to you, and so you have to build content so people um, will link to you. Or maybe you need more reviews for your business. Look at the areas where you're weak versus your competitors. And I find that that's the most valuable thing is to think about how can I catch up with these people. Cameron Harris of Tank on Cleaning asks, should the SEO on each page of my website be the same or should it be different? Mm, SEO, I'm going to assume title tags and content. Um, Mm. Yeah, each page should focus on different topics. I say try to only push five to seven different key phrase ideas on a page. You want to keep each page thematically uh, similar. You know, you're not going to talk about 18 different topics. So a mistake I find a lot of people make is they'll have a services page and they list absolutely everything that they do, but they don't have separate pages talking about that particular service in depth. So have a main services page so that people will look at it, but then also have a page for each of the types of services that you do. That's such a great tip and and a rookie error by so many businesses. Like you're right. I mean, Google, when when you list so many things on one page. Google are like, what's that page about? Um, yeah, how am I, I supposed to rank this? How am I supposed yeah. to rank? Um, you know, I, I see that a lot with FAQ um, pages, which I don't really like those pages. You know, you've got FAQ and then there's like 20 questions and you click mm-hmm. on one question and you, then you get this little funky drop down that answers it. But mm-hmm. I imagine outside of it looking funky, it's pretty useless. Whereas one question, one good answer per page would be a better uh outcome, right? Well, what you should do with your FAQ is each one of those, you can answer it quickly in a couple of lines, and then you have an expanded answer and say a blog post, and then you link over to that. Oh, Dana, that's why they pay you the big bucks. There is no doubt about it. (laughs) Robert Wheeler of Rapid Recovery Room. He says, I'm paranoid about voice search. Oh, this is interesting. Like Siri, Google Assistant, and Alexa. Apparently, Mm -hmm. everyone is voice searching on their phones these days, and I'm not sure about the best way to get and keep myself in that game. Mm, I think voice search is wildly overstated. I think a bunch of technical nerds got really excited about it. But in reality, most of us are just yelling at our phones saying, Alexa, look this up, and then nothing happens, right? Or then it starts to tell you a joke, and you're like, no, I wanted you to turn on the lights. (laughs) So I really do think that voice search is not as big as people think it is. Um, And realistically, voice searches are just searches. So 
make sure you're ranking well for the types of things that people would search for if they were saying it to their phone instead of typing it in. But searches themselves are also getting longer and longer. People are typing in sentences. They're asking questions, whether it's through voice or whether it's through actually typing it into a computer or a smartphone. So just make sure you're showing up for those types of longer question phrases. So your point there is, first of all, right here and now, coming towards the end of 2018, voice search is still a novelty. It's mm-hmm. going to, it's going to, it will at some point reach a critical mass where we're all using it. However, I think your big point there is, it's just a search. So what we're talking into Alexa is potentially what we're typing into Google anyway, right? Yeah, and I mean, a fun thing to look for, actually, is, you know, when you go into Google and you start typing and it's got that uh, auto-suggest that comes up where it's thinking about where, where else you could go with the thing that you're typing in. Yes. So type in Google and then hit a space and then type in Google again, start typing it in again, and then you'll see all the stuff that people say when they're talking to their phone. And my Google Assistant just <laughs> turned on and I was saying that. Shh, go away. <laughs> go away. Um, but... That's people who are talking to their phones and didn't realize that Google turned on when they said, okay, Google. And Uh, then all of a sudden now they're out when it turned on again, go away. (laughs) I'm going to throw it in the next room. (laughs) But the, uh, but this is what's happening is that people are saying it, not realizing that they said it and they're saying it again. And so those are actually some really funny phrases you can use in things like Google ads because (laughs) people who are clearly struggling with their phones. (laughs) I love it. That's a nice little hack. Scott Pendlebury of the Renovator Store asks, I often wonder why most e-commerce companies write their content and then hire an SEO specialist, he puts in quotes, to rewrite Mm -hmm. it. Given SEO is really about having relevant, amazing and engaging content for the user, my question is, why isn't it better to make SEO the core strategy of an e-commerce company's content team? That is a great question. I totally agree with you. And I do not know why they would hire an SEO specialist to rewrite it. And honestly, if there's someone calling themselves an SEO specialist who's rewriting your content for SEO, like just you know what the keywords are. If I give a list of keywords to the content people and say, look, these are the things that people are Googling, go forth and write the amazing content that you do, but please keep these things in mind. You shouldn't need to go back and do it again. Making it more boring for SEO is so 2005. You do not need to do that anymore. Just write great content and make sure you're thinking about keywords. That's what's important. Yeah, I, I think that you, it all comes down to writing great content. I mean, putting put Google out of your mind, put SEO technicalities out of your mind, and like all great marketing, focus on your ideal customer. Yeah, and people too will get really tunnel vision and say, oh, well, we have to think about SEO, but SEO is the actual human being who's going to search that thing and then click on your site. And if that is boring, then nobody's going to want to buy your stuff. So make sure it's interesting. Now, I like this question. Shane Strutton of Eagle Mont Tennis Club, I think he's a coach down there, asks, how effective is Google My Business for SEO? Does it increase your organic ranking? Now, you've touched on that, but let's just go back because Google My Business, I'm sure, has had about 40 names since its inception a few years ago. You are correct, yes. (laughs) So where are we at? What is it? And what have we got to do as a small business owner to optimize our Google My Business listing? Yeah, so when you do a search in Maps or if a map-based search comes up and there's that listing for your business, that is your Google My Business listing. So you have to have one if you have a physical location or if you service a business or your service area business like a plumber where people, maybe you work out of a van, make sure that uh, you have that service area business claimed on Google My Business, really key. Now, the way in which map-based results rank is totally differently than how organic results rank. So when I talk about map-based results, I mean you're on maps.google.com.au and you're doing a search and it's all maps. Or if you're on Google and you've done a search for, say, plumber and you see that little map box that comes up, we call that a three-pack there's three listings in the box, Mm -hmm. that's local. Everything else is organic. And those are two different algorithms that rank things two different ways. Okay, so just hold so, that thought just with the map yeah. one. So when it shows mm-hmm. the map and it's got three listings underneath, mm-hmm. how do I make sure that my business is, is one of them? Yep, so that's that local ranking factor you, study you, I talked about. But the major pieces are um, making sure you say what you do on your website. <sighs> I mean, Please don't make your title tag say home. Um, Lots of great reviews, long reviews, reviews that have the keywords that say, you know, John came out and fixed my sink and it was great. Um, But make sure they're long reviews. That really makes a difference. Lots of reviews on different websites other than Google. So, for example, Yelp, TripAdvisor, um, Facebook reviews. These all matter because what you're trying to show Google is that you're a real business and real businesses 
have reviews in lots of different places, fake businesses don't. So really it's being out there in the community. All of those things matter for your Google My Business uh, rankings. If there is 10 plumbers who have all completed their Google My Business to a fairly good degree, they've got the testimonials, they've got addresses, they've got opening hours, they've got pictures, they've got, you know, a lot of stuff that they've used. What's Google going to do then? Default to alphabetical order or...? Um, they will look at things like Google, Google posts, what I mentioned before. So make sure you're doing Google posts and they will look at things like how often do people leave reviews that actually makes a huge difference. They'll also consider how many people click on your listing and proximity to the physical location is a big factor for ranking. So two people could be just a few blocks away, Google exactly the same thing and they might get different results as, uh, because of that. Yeah. Okay. Sandy Taylor of Sandy Taylor Digital Marketing uh, says, as an SEO copywriter, oh, here we go, she's an SEO copywriter, who works with small businesses who are new to marketing, my number one question would be whether Google will develop Google My Business into a workable substitute for a website for sole traders and optimistic hobbyists who aren't ready for a full website yet. Well, they actually offer that already. They do have Google websites, which are bundled into Google My Business, just to make it extra confusing. And you can get a free website from Google. It's actually aimed at mostly developing countries such as India, Brazil, um, those types of countries for those websites. But if you're just getting started, go ahead and make one of those. Or we see lots of people who have Facebook pages listed as their website on their Google My Business page. That's also completely fine to do that. Okay. Robert Kal- uh, Kajalj, oh, I can't pronounce that, of Lease Communications asks, if I pay for Google AdWords, would that increase my Google juice? Oh, don't use that. Use authority. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> After my ad has expired. No, there is no linkage between Google organic results and Google ads, 100% completely separate. Um, I know somebody out there said they were linked to one time. They are not. You sure? Don't Google go, I'm oh, so that, business is, sure. that business is spending a lot of money with us on AdWords. I think we'll improve their organic ranking. No, they would be. They would never. Two separate honestly. rooms at the Google Plex, Completely you reckon? Completely separate. They don't even talk to each other. <laughs> Different buildings, yeah. Do they play air hockey together during lunch? I cannot guarantee that, but I can say that the Google SEO team is very ethical. They would not want that to happen. Have you been there? Um, I have not, but several people I know have. Right. And I have, I have met a lot of the Google webmaster team and, and talked to them, and they are very ethical people. Are they really geeky? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to be. Yes, true. How would you rank your geekiness, Dana, oh, on, on a 1 dirty. to 10? Yeah. Oh, probably an 11. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Let's, let's see. I started learning uh, DOS when I was eight. Um, I t- spent a summer teaching myself basic, how to program video games in basic when I was nine. Oh, wow. Uh, I've been a nerd for a long time. Yeah. What, what's your favorite gadget right now? Oh, man. I would say, well, I just got a new Google Pixel phone, and I love it. But I also recently picked up a Microsoft Surface laptop, and I've been a big ThinkPad user for years. Mm -hmm. And I finally went to Surface, and it is fantastic. So if you are a Windows user or even some of the Apple people in the office are a little bit jealous of the Surface, which I was not expecting. Yeah, yeah, they are impressed by it. So give it a whirl. I'm really enjoying it as a travel laptop. All right, done. Enamel Hassan asks, how much of an impact does content marketing play when doing local SEO for small businesses? Is it really worthwhile pitching content marketing to local businesses like tradies, small retail shops, or service professionals in a local area to help them rank well? We touched on that. What have you got to add, Dana? Mm -hmm. I would say it depends on competition, um, how many other people are trying to rank, you know, how sophisticated the competition is. Content may not be the first thing that you want to do, but if you are got the basics down and you're ready to go to the next level, absolutely, content will be the thing that gets you there. Okay. Jim Knott asks, can a business perform well from an SEO perspective purely from organic strategies? Yeah, well, that would be, that would be what, what you would do about. for SEO. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to explain, just for those who don't understand, what is organic? What is an organic listing? An organic listing is a non-paid listing on Google. Go. So you see the ads up at the top, sometimes the bottom. Those are the paid pieces. Organic is anything that isn't in a map. Okay, got it. Yorn Steins 
asks, I run a small design training agency and my biggest problem to f- is to find the time and energy to create content, e.g. write blog articles. Hence, I ordered a few thousand word articles from a text broker portal, but they have not improved my website's visibility. Any ideas on how to make this work? Yeah, don't do that. Um, <laughs> Why? That's Well, it's just it's just crap, honestly. It's just somebody who doesn't know you just churning out crap, and it doesn't necessarily bring any uniqueness to you. It doesn't show your value as a business. It's just a, it's not anything people are going to find interesting, right? I find a lot of these topics are super general, and it's not necessarily anything people are Googling, and they also sell it to a bunch of other businesses. So we go back to that duplicate content issue. It, it isn't for you. Mm. So if you really are struggling with the time and energy to create content, Writing is not the only way to create content. As I said, sit down with a webcam and record yourself talking about something that you did that week for 10 minutes, make a transcript, da-da, you've created content. I like that. There's many ways of creating content. I mean, and, you know, yeah. as you say, like uh, writing is just one of them. We talk a lot about blogging and therefore writing, but mm-hmm. do, do Google have a view on words versus audio versus video? Google own YouTube they- after all. Yeah, I mean, they can't really understand uh, words from a ranking perspective, words in a video from a ranking perspective yet. So that's why you really do need to provide closed captioning or a transcript. There's also sitemaps specific to videos. So if you use a video hosting service like Wistia, for example, they provide SEO-friendly video embedding on your website. So I'd recommend looking into that if you do lots of video. But really, to get started with, make the video, toss it up on YouTube, embed it on your site, order a transcript, make sure that's on the page. Talk to me about podcasting within that conversation. Go on. Yeah, you should have transcripts too. I have. I have. And there'll be a transcript for this uh, episode, absolutely. Uh, And that's what you need. So podcasting is an SEO ranking factor? It's pretty big, isn't it? Yeah, and there's also schema for podcasting. You should look into that too. Oh, gee. I might need a good SEO company. Do you know any? (laughs) Uh, not really. They're, they're all terrible. <laughs> oh, come on. It's the opportunity <laughs> to self-promote. I'll do it for you. You're listening to the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thanks to American Express. And we're talking with SEO expert Dana DiTomaso from Kickpoint. I'm far too Canadian to promote myself. That's the problem. <laughs> It's an Australian problem as well, just being part of the Commonwealth. (laughs) Steve Witt from the UK, his business is Not Just Travel, asks, if I have 400 local agents all across the UK, how does each agent get found at a local level? Yeah, so if... Each agent has an office that people can actually go to and not that isn't their house. Um, You can have Google My Business pages for each of those agents and you should definitely set those up. So that will give them a spot on the map and then you should implement all the local SEO tactics that we talked about, everything that you see from that local ranking factor survey for each of those individual agents, obviously for 400. That's a lot of work at your end. Mm. So this is where the agents can come in and help you with some of that as well, such as Google Posts. I know, Steve, and those agents aren't... A lot of them do work from home. What's the problem mm-hmm. with working from home and, and doing Google that? doesn't want to have your home business on there. They want you to have list. If, if you want to have the actual address listed, which does rank you better on the map than just having a service area business, then Google will want you to have a place that people can actually go to, like an actual physical office. Well, that's so a bit sometimes hard for I'll those, say, all of us who yeah. work from home. Well, you know, rent a co-working space. <laughs> yeah, it's good to leave the house now and I again. Know, I know. Get out and about. <laughs> Okay, uh, Charlie Morton, how do I choose keywords and what constitutes a long tail keyword? Yeah, so long tail keywords are keywords that are, you know, long. Um, The idea of that is that there's lots of basic things that people will search for. So, for example, I'll say books. Books is a head keyword, very basic. Crime books, right? Also pretty basic. Crime books set in Alaska with a female protagonist. That's a long tail keyword. So the thing with long tail keywords is you can't really predict what they are because there's millions of different ways that people could type that in. So you have to think about the general topics. And for Google, that's what they're thinking about is what is the general topic? So they're thinking a crime novel set in Alaska with a female protagonist. Okay, so they've got a kind of a sense and they'll come back and say, here's a mystery series you might like for example, based on the topics. So really they're thinking about, you know, mystery, crime, Alaska, female. 
and that's the entities that they're pulling out of that particular search. So when you're thinking about long tail keywords, don't worry about optimizing for long tail keywords, but do think about the types of topics that people might add on to their keywords in order to be more specific, particularly if the first results they get are kind of generic and not necessarily specialized to them, they might start adding on more and more words to get down to what they actually want. So really be specific in the type of content that you provide. And when you're researching keywords, again, I mentioned um, some keyword research tools from Moz, Ahrefs, SEMrush, they can tell you what people are Googling and you can work those keywords into your content. Is it fair to say, Dana, that the longer the tail on the keyword, the closer the closer someone is to buying from you? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that's 100% accurate, but I would say that somebody is much more specific about what they want when they get down to that end of things. So you can definitely... Um, you can definitely ensure that people are finding you at least at that point, but that doesn't necessarily mean they want to buy. It might be that they realize they, they have been searching for the wrong thing. I find that that happens a lot too, mm. where they're not necessarily getting the right results. And then they get down and like, Oh, it's actually called this, for example. So that can be another value that you provide is if there's a lot of terms that get confused in your industry, that's where you can clarify some of that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Leanne Parrish asks, what's the best way to get a website to rank for different geo tags? I might get you to ask, explain what a geo tag is, but uh, Leanne goes on to say, for example, you might have a business based in Tamworth, but they might want to rank in Armadale and Coffs Harbour. How do you get them to rank for areas surrounding Tamworth without adding separate pages. We often get clients who want only five-page websites, so getting them to rank for a far-reaching service area is proving difficult. Please help. Yeah, you can. Um, (laughs) They're going to have to accept that they have to have more pages. Um, Honestly, I find that you have to be able to explain to Google that you do service these areas. It can be something as simple as a testimonials page. We went and serviced this person in Armandale and we did this work for them and they loved us, for example. You can have that in reviews. It might help a little bit, but it's even better if you can have a case study on your website talking about that. That makes a huge difference. So you're going to have to add more pages. You can in Google My Business indicate your service areas and that helps a little bit, but it's better to have that content on your site. What about these websites you come across where they've keyword stuffed down the bottom, often in the footer? Like mm-hmm. a, that's, a hundred... that's old school local old school. SEO for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we love a bit of old school, just not when it comes to SEO. It gets frowned upon. <laughs> Matt from Stargazing in the UK asks, regarding the layout of a website nowadays, should you have all your products on the main page so the URL is as short as possible? Or should you categorize them and have them two or three pages down the tree? It's better to categorize them if it involves adding in keywords, for sure. Um, I mean, really, Google, too, they're, they're almost getting rid of URLs a little bit in search results. You might see that instead of listing the actual URL with the slashes and the dashes, they're actually just writing the name of what the page is as you go down. That's also using a schema, a breadcrumb markup schema. So really think about what's the best way to logically organize your products. And if that involves a lot of folders, so be it. Just make sure it's easier for people to get there with things like drop-down menus, which some people think is passe. People like drop-down menus. You don't want to surprise people on a website, right? You want to make it easy for them to get to where they want to go. So provide that information for them. I've got to say, Dana, looking at the kickpoint.ca website, it is Mm -hmm. beautiful. It is so easy to get around. It's not chockers with content. Uh, Mm -hmm. You've put a lot of work into that, haven't you? Yeah, our team has worked super hard on that, and I will pass that along to our design team and well, our developers. They're, they're fantastic. It's just a great website. You know, I want to see a website in action, and we talked at the top of this uh, interview about you know getting your website right before you start sending traffic to it. Um, mm-hmm. That would be your, – your website would be a good place to start. Well, I'll tell you a little story about our website, actually. We had – the version we had before this, we were getting a lot of really mediocre, not great leads. And so we really went back and thought about what we wanted to have on our website and what would make the difference for the kind of business that we wanted to attract. And this was a huge project. This took, I would say, almost a year from start to finish. And when it was launched, we saw an immediate improvement in the quality of leads that we got, just overnight improvement. And we have landed clients that would not have considered us before based on the quality of website we had before. So it's really made a massive improvement in our business. It took a lot of work, but the payoff was totally worth it. Clearly. Mm -hmm. Adam Lawrence from Imperium Consulting asks, if you were to recommend a small business owner to invest time into the learning of and money into the purchase of one all-encompassing SEO management solution, which would it be and why? 
Mm. I would say, you know, it's interesting because I've recommended three. So there's Moz, Ahrefs, and SEM Rush, and they feel like the big three in this industry. Um, SEM Rush does a lot of things. Mm. A lot. So if you're doing any paid and you want SEM Rush to keep an eye on that as well, that's good. I would say that Moz, um, their tool has not been super great in the past couple of years, but they've recently reinvested a lot of time and money into it. And right now, their link building tools and their keyword research tools, I think, are the best out there. So Moz would also be another really strong contender to check out. This show is made possible thanks to American Express Business Explorer credit card. A card that lets your business expenses reward you. I asked Amex member Chris Gray, CEO of Property Buying Business Your Empire, how he benefits from using his Amex. I use Amex for the whole of my business. Literally every single thing I pay in my business, even down to effectively my staff or my contractors and my rent at home, everything goes on the Amex card. Because with Amex, you get the most points for your dollar spent. And I convert those points into frequent flyer rewards points. I fly 10 or 15 times a year, only business and first class, including those beautiful A380 suites you get on Singapore Airlines where you get your own bedroom. And I fly for free. I don't pay for a single flight. But it's not all upside. Or is it? So I've got a, I've still got a million points because I spend so much money in my business. I've then got to pre-plan 10 trips for next year of where do I want to go? I need to find excuses to go to different countries. <laughs> this is a massive first world problem, Chris. It is, but I'm willing to put up with it. So there's, there's very few people that can, uh, can force themselves through the pain barrier, but I'm willing to do it. I've trained myself. <laughs> New American Express card members who apply and spend $3,000 in the first three months from the card approval date receive a bonus 100,000 membership rewards points. Ah, you got to love it when your business expenses reward you. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Offer ends November 30, 2017. Terms and conditions apply. And this is a self-indulgent question from me, Dana. Mm -hmm. What would your SEO strategy be to (laughs) maximise the number of small business owners in Australia to hear this episode? Well, I would start reaching out to different Australian business associations and seeing if they would mention your podcast in their newsletters, which you think, well, that's not good for SEO, but people are going to see that and then they're going to link to your podcast from their websites. Likely these business associations will also link to your podcast from their websites. Really, you're providing a great service and why not try to get the word out there about it? And you don't ask for the link. You just tell people that you have this thing and then they can link or not link if they choose. Well, I call that a partnership strategy and it's worked beautifully for me. I mean, this show is the business show on Virgin Australia Airlines, both domestically and internationally. Um, that was through a phone call. Um, it's on the Small Business Mentoring Institute of Australia. It's on the Small Business Association of Australia. Um, I... I, I try to at least once a month kind of develop a new partnership. I'm talking to entrepreneur organisation at the moment. So very, very, because what it gives you is amplification. You know, it's one, all of a sudden, you know, one to many. Yep, absolutely. And that's, that's where you need to be. And what I would say too, is if for all these people who've sent in questions, you know, if they want to talk about how they implemented the answer to the question, how I've answered their question, and then they can write up what they did and the impact that they had and then link to you. That would also be really valuable. Uh, as in, a, like, do you mean a blog post or a, co- a comment? A blog post on their own website. Yeah. So okay. I listened to this podcast and Dana, here's a link, thanks so much, said this, and then thanks so much to Tim for, you know, creating this great program and link to you. Why would that be? I mean, I'd love everyone to do that, but, you know, if I'm... If I'm well, let's choose one. Matt from Stargazing UK. I'm guessing he's a business that takes people out at night to look at the stars. Now, an article, a blog post on his blog, talking about what you just said, is of no interest to anyone wanting to stargaze. Mm-hmm. Well, that would be where it can be a published page. It's not necessarily something you promote, but if you uh, want people to provide value in terms of links, you know, you can think about it in terms of you got a link from another number of different organizations. They aren't necessarily the highest value links out there, but it does sound like you've gotten some really high value links, and then you have to start thinking about what can I do next. Yeah, you know, okay. I have all these links, or you can start talking to organizations. I mean, you could write the you know Edmonton Chamber of Commerce. They, I interviewed Dana on my show. Would you link to it? Got it. Got it. Dana, that's the end of the listener questions. Now, I'm going to break the interviewer rule book here by saying, 
is there anything we've missed? You never ask that at the end of it. Is there anything we haven't covered? Anything else you'd like Oof. to talk about? Uh, we have covered so much stuff. We... I just w- really want to reiterate, make sure you get results from the SEO company that you hire. That's the biggest thing. And don't let there be any secrets, surprises, mysteries. You should own your own Google Analytics account. You should own your own Google Ads account. Don't let your agency set that up for you and then never give you administrative access for that, especially your Google My Business account. We see this happen all the time, and it's such a pain because we lose all this data, and we have to start you over again from scratch. So please make sure you control those logins. And just on Google Analytics, I think it might have been the first time we mentioned it, that is a valuable resource to at least check in, you know, once a month and get a sense of, you know, how much traffic you're getting, what's your bounce rates, what are some, what would maybe the top five things that you would look at in your Google Analytics account? Uh, you want to make sure you've got your goals set up. So take the time to do that properly. My favorite report is under acquisition, where you're looking at all the different channels that are bringing you traffic. And if you have your goals set up right, you can see which channels are bringing you the best uh, traffic in terms of conversions. And then you're going to want to look at content. So you're looking at all the pages on your site and seeing how people are engaging with it. But don't put too much energy into bounce rate. Because um, again, if you let's say you're writing lots of blog posts and you're promoting them, and then people are visiting that one blog post and then leaving, well, it looks like a bounce, but maybe it's a repeat visitor. So it's okay that they bounced. You know, don't put too much stock into bounce rate. Love it. Dana, you've been incredibly generous in your time. So thank you. Thank you for having uh, me. I will absolutely be calling on you as we head into 2020 <laughs> to see what's changed. But, but I think one of the big learnings is clearly get the fun, like anything, get the fundamentals right. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't geek out on all the other stuff. Oh, um, I find people go to a conference and they hear this one, you know, one weird trick to increase your SEO. And then they go and do that one weird trick and it doesn't work because everything else is broken. So really make sure you got the basics down. Uh, that newsletter you mentioned, how do people sign up for it, Dana? They go to kickpoint.ca. You can go to slash newsletter to go directly there. It's in the footer of every page of our site. Clever. Dana Tommaso, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, there you go, team. Kick points, Dana D. Tommaso. A big thank you to all of you who sent me your questions. It made putting these two episodes together so incredibly easy and clearly from the reviews last week's episode got incredibly beneficial. Now, If you weren't in information overload after part one last week, then you may well be now. But don't stress, as you can download the PDFs of the full transcription of this and last week's episode over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 439. Plus, you'll also find the links to all the resources Dana mentioned there as well. Here's my top three attention grabbers. Thanks to our supporting partners at American Express. Be sure to Google Amex Business to find out how your business expenses can reward you. Attention grabber number one, get your SEO fundamentals right. Great advice by Dana. Title tags, your website's load time. Maybe you need to change hosts. That would be a good thing if your website's loading slowly. Uh, Maybe you've got too many photos on it or big you know, big filed photos. Uh, Be mobile friendly, update your website at least monthly, just get all the fundamentals right. Attention grabber number two, complete your Google My Business account and be sure to post on a regular basis. Great advice by Dana to say, you know, complete all the information Google want on Google My Business, but then update your posts on a regular basis. I'd say weekly if you can, that'd be a good thing. Attention grabber number three, Create helpful content that solves the problems of your precious customers. You heard me, you've heard you heard me bang on about this for the last few years, really. We touched on in my chat with Dana, but be a helpful business owner. Create great, great, a great podcast, a great blog, maybe a great YouTube channel. Have helpful content on your website. Have a knowledge center. I talk about that a lot in my book, The Boomerang Effect, and Google love helpful businesses. I'd love to know which of all Dana's ideas resonated with you the most. And you can tell me by leaving a comment over in the show notes at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 439. Well, that almost wraps up another episode of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thanks to American Express. If you're wondering what the award was, just as a reminder, this show won the best business and marketing podcast in Australia at the recent Australian Podcast Awards. Whoop, whoop.
Hey, be sure to search Amex Business to discover which card is right for that beautiful business of yours. Next week, we hear from a fellow who owns two fishing tackle stores, which he's recently taken online, pun intended. And that's a very interesting story in itself. Don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, 439 interviews, actually. If you love the show, then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone, opening up the podcast app, searching Small Business Big Marketing, hitting subscribe, handing it back to them and saying, you're welcome. Then move on to the next one. Until next week, I am Timbo Reid. Always have been, always will be. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.